No, we're gonna push it back. So the following Monday. So following Monday. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's uh 5 30 let's go to get started all right good evening everyone how's everyone doing today all right good. Doing good. Doing good. Tired. i am pretty tired so i was uh i was at a wedding yesterday Ooh, um it was a wedding from my, one of my really good friends, and so I, I gave a speech at the wedding. And so, um, we hear it? Uh, there's probably a video online somewhere. It's probably on YouTube. Um, I'll find it. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, the thing is, like when you're giving a speech at a wedding, you want to make sure that you're coherent, you know, right? Because you're giving a speech right next to the bride and groom, and you know, throwing up on the bride and groom while you're giving your speech is not a good look. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. And so I didn't drink anything before uh, until my speech, and then after that, I tried to make up for uh, lost time and not uh which was not a good idea which was a good idea at the time but you know the me today is kind of regretting it a little bit so i might be a little bit low energy today but uh you know we're gonna try to get through today as the best we can okay all right so the plan for today um you know you can see from the learning objectives we're going to continue on with our notes on diffusion with finite volumes uh, so we're going to finish up that notes those notes today so you can finish up the homework and so homework five remember i pushed the due date back for that until friday uh, so after today, you should have everything you need to do, both for the hand calculation and for the coding parts. And so uh, make sure you get that done by Friday. The other thing I wanted to start with today is talking about the final project. So I posted the final project specifications uh, last week. And so I wanted to go to uh, go over together with you guys in terms of what uh, you need to do, what kind of what codes you need to write and what's expected in terms of the final uh, report. OK. And so we'll go over that and, uh, you know, we'll take a look in, in terms of that. And so you have a little bit over a month, maybe about like six weeks to do the final project. And so the final project is going to be due on the Monday after final review. And so that's Monday, May 22nd. And so today is April 10th. And so, yeah, that's about, uh, that's about six weeks of, of time. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on anything before we, we get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's go over the uh, um, the final project specifications. So these are posted online. So let me go and share my screen. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll bring I'll bring the uh, the iPad back for the people that are in person here a bit later. All right. So these are the final project specifications. And so in order to find them, you can go to assignments, and then if you scroll down here, you can click on final project. Okay. And you'll see that there are a bunch of files here that you can uh, that you can download. So the first thing that you will, that where you can see, and which is the document we're going to go over mostly today, is the instructions or the specifications I call it. Okay. Um, I also have the rubric, and so if you want to see how the, all the points are going to break down for the final project in terms of the report and the code, um, there's a template for the report. I will go over that in a second, and I have all the starter codes here. And if you'll notice, there's two different flavors of starter codes. There's, there's the finite different starter code and the finite volume starter code. Okay. Uh, if you're an undergraduate uh, and you're taking this class, uh, you can choose. And so I'll, I'll let you guys make the decision if you want to use finite difference, which is basically everything that we have been doing up until you know the last couple of weeks, or if you want to do finite volume, which is all the recent stuff, which is the stuff that we're going to play. Okay. So if you're an undergraduate, you can choose either one. If you're a graduate student, you need to write both codes, but you only need to write one report. Okay, so it's not, it sounds like you're doing twice the work, but it's only, but the two codes are are, are similar in ways. And so, you know, you'd only be doing maybe 30% more work, um, which is about about the amount of an extra assignment. So that's why I have that. Okay. I don't know why it does this. I, I tried to post the video for the solutions of what it's going to look like, but the videos on Canvas never work. But I'll show you the videos because I've uploaded the raw files here, uh, maybe after we, uh, we go over the specifications. Okay. okay. 
So the final project is you're going to be simulating a uh, spinning uh, die field. And so the situation, um, you know, kind of uh, I try to illustrate it with this image here that I found off Google um, is you have a you have a situation where you have um, kind of a, a blank canvas or I would say kind of a, a pool of water and you're and you're dripping paint into it. OK, and then what you're going to do after that or what's going to happen is that you're going to start to swirl the velocity field. Okay? And so imagine there's kind of like a um, kind of like a, a turntable underneath. And so that's going to spin. It's going to cause the paint to mix. Okay? And then you're going to see the results. Right? So if we scroll down here, this is kind of what it looks like. And so we have kind of a, a yellow circle here. You know, you're basically basically dripping yellow paint into like a blue canvas. And then once the simulation starts, it's, the velocity field is going to start swirling and this paint is going to, to mix. Okay. All right, so it's basically a direct application of, of kind of everything that we've uh, we've been doing, and so it's basically going to be an unsteady um, 2D um, convection diffusion equation. Okay? Um, and so this is the equation for it. Okay? And so we have our unsteady term here, uh, partial feed, partial t. We have our velocity u, which is going to be a function of x, y, and t. We have partial feed, partial x, the y velocity, and the diffusion term. And so the first thing you'll, you'll notice here is the velocity expression are, are going to be quite a bit more complex. Okay? So to simulate kind of the swirling pattern, uh, we have to have a function that changes with time and with space. Okay? So our velocities are going to be, you know, cosine one half pi t times sine of two pi y times sine squared of pi x. And then the y velocity is going to be minus cosine one half pi t sine of two pi x sine squared of pi. So they go complicated, but you know, again, you know, usually for for complicated equations like this, you would just input it directly into the code. Okay, so this looks like it's kind of a big deal, but it's it's kind of really not. Okay? And this is the domain that you're going to be solving it on. And so we have kind of a standard two D domain. The length of the domain is one in each direction, and we have uh, basically a Neumann boundary condition of zero on all of the boundaries. Okay, so that's basically just to make sure that any of the dye or any of the paint doesn't leak out of the domain. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about what it, what is different about this uh, this project. And so, you know, the I think probably the first kind of big difference that you'll see in this project compared to all of our homework assignments is that we're starting with a um, you know more complex initial condition. Okay, and so usually for simulations like this, if you remember from homework four, we start with a zero initial condition, and so we basically assume that you know the solution everywhere starts at zero. That's not going to be the case here, and so because we don't have any we're basically not introducing any dye or any paint um, besides that. We're going to be starting with kind of initial paint field and then kind of swirling that. And so this is the formula that you can use for the paint field. Okay? And so it's uh, basically going to be your standard distance formula um, modified by, um, you know, by a radius. Okay? And these are kind of the, uh, the parameters that you're going to input into, into that. Okay. And so this is kind of what you can expect. And so basically you're gonna start with kind of an initial ring. And so your paint here is gonna start with the ring. And then as the, as the solution goes, the paint is gonna to start to swirl around in a circle. Okay? And after a certain point, actually the, the flow field is gonna reverse. And so what you're gonna see is that, you know, you're gonna, it's gonna rotate clockwise at first. And then after a certain amount of time, the flow is actually gonna reverse and it's gonna come back the other. Way. So actually, let me show you the video now, just so, uh, just so you can kind of see what to expect. So let's see, project, this one's fine. Let me start it over. Okay, so at the beginning here, you can see that we start with kind of a ring. And then as the solution goes, you can see the ring is gonna to start to deform, it's gonna twist, but eventually it's gonna come back. And so it's gonna come back the other way, and it's gonna rotate the other way. And then it's gonna come back just like that. Okay, so we're basically gonna swirl it and then unswirl it. One more time, just so you can see. <clears throat> so I will say too that your your solution is probably not going to look exactly like this. So this is on a very very fine grid. So this is a hundred by hundred. So I think it took my computer about an hour to produce this simulation right here. Um, and so um, you know if you're confident in your solution, you can definitely do this. But it's not it's not going to be required. So this is this is kind of a little bit extreme. Okay, so let's come back to the spec specs. Yes, question. Um what kind of components do you have in your computer? Because if you want to do the higher, higher quality the simulation, what do you have? I have a four-year-old laptop. 
So at the time it was, uh, I spent about $1,500 on, on a gaming laptop, basically. Um, my laptop's a little bit more GPU heavy. The CPU is, um, it's like a, like a first generation i7 or something like okay. that. Yeah, so I think these computers, will, these the lab computers here will definitely be faster than, than that. And so if you want to do 100 by 100, it'll probably take you maybe around like 30, 40 minutes on, on these computers here. Yeah, that's 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 just estimates. Mm -hmm. Well, when we do okay, our- so Let's go back to the specs. Was oh, there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, when we do our actual simulation, we don't have to do it for that many, for that much grid spaces, right? No, no, no. Yeah, so that that's definitely not a requirement. And so, you know, even though my my laptop's a bit old, it's still I think it's pretty good. And so, you know, if you if you don't have as nice of a computer, you know, I don't want you sitting there for like three hours waiting for a simulation. So you'll you'll see here. So I'll I'll just kind of show you a preview just real quick. So the maximum uh, grid sizing that I need you to do is just a fifty by fifty. Okay. Um, and even even a 75 by 75 is, I think it's still gonna be pretty expensive, but this is not required at all. And so as long as you can do a 50 by 50, that should take you anywhere between like five, 10 minutes, even on a very modest computer. Uh, that's 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 all I want for credit. But of course you, you're, you're free to kind of push it a bit more, you know, for, for those people who have kind of more powerful computers, I think, you know, it's, you know, it's it's one thing that you always, you're always kind of curious to try. Um, and so, you know, you're free to do that, but it's it's not required for credit. All right, so let's talk about the requirements. And so, um, you know, just like I mentioned before, you know, this project is going to pull together basically all the techniques and all the methods that we've learned in the class, okay, whether it be finite difference or finite volume. And you have a choice. You can either do finite difference or finite volume for the final project. Okay? Uh, but if you are taking it for graduate credit, you have to do both, just like I mentioned before. Okay. Okay. So there are three main challenges, I'd say, I would say kind of three things that are a little bit different. Um, in this project compared to what we've done in the in the class. Okay? Um, like I mentioned before, so the first thing is going to be the initial condition. And so, you know, I think we the only thing we've ever done for unsteady problems is a zero initialization. And so we assume that everything was zero. This time, uh, it's not going to be zero. So you're going to start with, you know, some paint that's actually inside the inside the domain. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be the first thing. So, you know, I think once we once we kind of get uh, past more finite volume stuff, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about how to actually get started with this. Um, but I would say, you know, go ahead and try it, try it yourself. And so in the, if you look at the starter code, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of hints in the starter code on how to actually do this. Okay. Uh, number two is the, is the um, velocity field. Okay. Um, and so the uh, velocity field, so the U and V functions, they're both functions of X, Y, and T. Okay. Um, and so that means you're going to have to continually recompute the velocities at the current time step, right? which we've done this. We've, we've done this before. So we, we've, we've done this in an example, um, I believe maybe a couple of weeks ago when we were going over unsteady problems. You know, this is just kind of a, a little bit extra on top of that because of uh, it's also space dependent as well. Okay. All right. And the third complication has to do with something we're going to cover in a couple of weeks. And so, you know, we, it's a little bit hard to talk about this, this, uh, um, this um, this here, but we're going to introduce in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to introduce something called a higher order convection scheme. Okay? And so it's a little bit of a different way to simulate a convection phenomena, both in finite difference and finite volume. And that's going to help with uh, some of the issues that we see in 2D. Okay, um, But this is not required strictly for the, at least the first part of the project. Because okay? if you look at the if you look at the course website here, you can see for finite difference, there are two starter codes here. So there's one for the basic scheme and there's one for the higher order scheme. Okay? If you wanna do the project with the basic scheme uh, with finite differences, um, you know you have you basically have everything that you need to, to do this part of the project right now. And so you can basically fill this out uh, already. Uh, and in fact, you know if you compare this to some of our previous example codes, uh, especially in our unsteady, uh, unsteady um, you know, framework, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities in, in this starter code as that, okay? The only big difference, of course, is the initial condition. And so this, and so you can, you can already produce a, a video that looks very similar to what I showed you. And so, you know, you, if you, if you want, if you kind of decided that you want to do find a difference, you know, you can do, you know, like I mentioned before, about 80% of the code for the project already, okay? This other code, this higher order code, you know, we haven't learned this yet, uh, but we are going to learn it in a couple of weeks. You know, that's, that'll be our first order of business after the second midterm. So, um, but this is kind of just a little bit of a step up compared to the basic scheme. And so, you know, what I recommend, what I recommend that you do is, you know, start with the basic scheme 
And so this is just basic, you know, central difference um, for convection, you know, our, our usual central difference for diffusion. Okay, it's just in an unsteady framework. Start with this one, get it to work, um, get the video to work well, and then from there move on to the higher order scheme. Okay. <clears throat> okay, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so here are kind of the steps that I um, that I suggest that you take for the project. Okay. And so step one, download the starter code. So, so don't start from scratch. You know, start, start use, use the starter code because I've already written a lot of the, the skeleton for the code for you. Okay. Um, next, you're going to implement the initial condition. And there is a way in the code for you to check to make sure your initial condition is, is implemented correctly. Okay. And so definitely you can implement that you know, before you even go into the time. So make sure you that's that's all good. Next, you're going to implement the convection velocity field. So this part is actually pretty straightforward. You just basically plug in the formula uh, from earlier in the specifications in for the velocity. Okay? And, I, and I kind of tell you where to put that in in the starter code. Okay. Next step four is kind of what I just described. So you're going to implement the basic scheme. And so you're going to implement the basic discretization coefficients. Okay? And so this is basic central difference. This is basic kind of diffusion coefficients. So this is everything that we've, we've done before. Okay. Next, you're going to implement the high order scheme. So that's that's what you can do after the second midterm. Um, and then finally, once all that's there, then you're going to produce all the plots that you need for the final report. So that's basically just final production. So you know, just running the simulations, getting the plots, writing a report. Um, you know, that's step six and seven. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so what do I want? What do I want in your final report? So these are kind of all of these solution plots that I want you to show. Okay. And so you know, I want you to basically do a lot of comparisons. And so, you know, not only do I want you to write code for this class, but I want you to try out the code under uh, several different um, scenarios. And I want you to kind of explain to me what's happening. Okay. Um, and so this project is, is more than just a test of you writing your code. It's also a test of, you know, um, have you been kind of learning all of the conceptual information uh, from the class? And can you kind of use that to explain what you're getting in terms of your results? Okay. And so the first deliverable here is I want you to run the code with three different diffusion coefficients. And so I want you to run with the low diffusion case, a medium diffusion case, and a high diffusion case, okay? I want you to run it on a 50 by 50 grid, and I want you to basically compare your results, okay? And so because we're making you know, such big differences or such big changes in the diffusion coefficient, uh, you are gonna see very different results. And so you know, I want you to kind of you know, explain what those differences are, and I want you to explain kind of why you're seeing those differences, okay? And so, you know, for these deliverables here, you know, and I think, you know, I get a few people that do this every year. Um, you know, it's more than just the plots. You know, it's I I I want to see more than just you know the code working correctly, because um, I because I have that I have the code that works correctly. So I, I need more than just screenshots. What I want from you guys is for you to kind of you know explain what you're seeing in the results based on you know what we everything we've been learning in the class so far. Okay. So that's what I'm primarily going to be grading you on in your results section. So not only are you able to get the correct result, but are, can, are you able to explain what's happening, you know, based on what we what we've learned. Okay. okay. Uh, the second result I want you to show me is a comparison of the results with different um, different grid densities. Okay? So I want you to run a simulation on a 25 by 25. Then I want you to run a simulation on a 50 by 50. And I want you to again kind of comment on the results that you see. And so tell me what what am I what are what are you looking at in terms of these results? You know how are they different? Why are they different? Um, and make sure you you put that in the report. Okay. And of course here, you know if you want to if you want to kind of try out you want to push your computer to the limit here. You can also try it on a on a uh, finer grid. And so you can try it. You know I suggested seventy five by seventy five here, um, but you can also try hundred by hundred. I think the max that someone was able to do on a personal computer was 125 by 125. Um, yeah, I, tried, I, I tried 200 by 200 once and my computer just stopped working for a while. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So unless unless you have you know a a, a, a butt ton of RAM, you know it's it's going to be hard, more diff, it's going to be difficult to do anything over 100 by 100. But okay. um, you're welcome to try. And so you know um, you know even if you want, you know you could probably use one of these computers here. You know. Set a simulation up for 200 by 200, you know, just let it go, go get lunch or something like that, um, and then come back and then see if the simulation finished. Or maybe you blew up one of the computers here and then I get in trouble. So, you know, maybe that's, that's a thing, but you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so for that part, you know, I want you to comment basically, you know, you know what you expect to see from the results when you change the what you change the grid size, um, and you should see that in the results as well. Okay, so the third result here is I want you to compare your two different codes. Remember, you're writing two codes, one with the basic coefficients, one with the higher order coefficients. Um, and so I want you to comment on the differences. Uh, for this particular project, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of preface this by saying you're probably not going to see that much of a difference uh, just because of the way I've set it up. Um, but at the very least, you should get similar results between the two. Okay? Uh, and that kind of shows that both were implemented correctly. Okay. okay. And then for step four, uh, so the fourth result, I want you to be creative a little bit. I want you to change the shape of the initial condition um, and, and see how that affects your result. Okay? And so the initial condition I gave you was a circle. And so we basically drew a circle of paint in the domain and we swirled it and see what happens. But I want you to change the code so that instead of a circle, you know, maybe you draw a square or maybe you draw a line or something like that. Um, or maybe you draw just a triangle, you know, um, you know, be creative. You can even, you know, um, I know there's I know there's auto generators out there for like you know shapes that you can do on on a grid so you can you can be creative you know as long as there's no obscene image in it it's, it's fine. Um, so I want you to change the initial condition and I want you to basically show me the results. Okay. Okay. And then finally, you know, if you're taking the class for graduate credit and so if you're an undergraduate, you don't have to worry about step five here. Uh, but I want you to compare the results between your finite difference and finite volume methods. Okay? They should look very similar, and if not almost exactly the same. Um, but, you know, I want you to basically show me that both codes were implemented correctly. Okay. Okay. Um, and I want you to submit your code as well. Okay. So, so I can look it over. So, you know, I'll, I'll be reading your reports and your code just to make sure everything is looking good. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. Okay. And so, yeah, so just the, uh, so just kind of repeat this. And so, you know, I want you guys to submit your reports. I want you guys to submit your codes um, and uh, I want you to submit one video as well. Okay, so the code, the way I've set up the starter code is that it, it's gonna produce a video. And so I want you to upload that video file just so I can take a look at it as well, okay? All right, so the final report components. Um, so basically it's, it's gonna be written in the style of a scientific report. And so you're gonna be writing an introduction. You're gonna be writing a methodology section. Um, you're gonna be writing your results and discussing your results and the conclusion. And so just because someone asks me every year, and so, you know, I don't, I don't have a page limit or I don't have a page requirement on the results, just because everyone formats the, re the reports a little bit differently. Um, so I don't, I don't like to put a limit on it, but, but in, on average, I would say kind of the average length of the report is about 10 to 12 pages. And that includes, you know, if you have a title page or if you have the figures and things like that as well. Okay. I'm not too picky about the format. And so, you know, I know some people like to use LaTeX and so you know, that would be beautiful. The only thing I the only thing I ask is that if you use uh, please use the report template, um, and please use the section headers. Okay, so you can use you can use whatever font or whatever you want. And so the only thing I ask is that you keep kind of the the report organized in kind of the same way, just so it's easy for me to kind of pick out your your results and, and grade it. Okay. Okay. And so for the methodology section, so the I, I think the rest is pretty standard. You've you've seen those in in your lab classes before. So introduction, results, conclusions. Uh, but the methodology section is going to be really important. And so for the methodology, I want you to describe the method that you're using. Okay? And I want you guys to take a perspective of, you know, you're, you're going to be showing this report. I want you guys to, to imagine that you're going to be showing this report to one of your peers who's not in the class. And so I want you to write the report kind of from the perspective that you're going to teach someone about finite differences. You're going to teach someone about finite volumes. Um, and so you can reasonably expect that, you know, whoever's reading your report has, has, a, has a good level of technical knowledge. But they've just never heard of finite difference before. Okay, so I do expect to see equations. I do expect to see. I don't. I don't expect to see any derivations, but I do expect to see kind of enough equations in the report so that you know someone who's never seen finite differences before can at least get a good understanding of kind of what you're doing in terms of the in terms of the theory. Okay, and so this this project here, you know, it's it's you know the code obviously is going to be a big part of it, but you know a lot of the the project I'm going to be testing your conceptual knowledge from the class as well. Okay. So that's why we're not having a final exam, just having a final project. And so it's testing both your conceptual knowledge and your coding, your coding skills. Okay. okay, so teams. So there are no teams. And so this is an individual project. Um, and so everyone's going to be turning in a report. Everyone's going to be writing their own code. Uh, but with that said, you know, the coding, the coding is going to be, you know, I think, I think going to be, you know, probably one of the more intimidating aspects of this project. So you know, uh, don't be afraid, you know, work, you can work together with your classmates. Um, in terms of developing the code, 
Um, but you know, but I, I expect you guys, I, I still expect everyone to write their own code. So don't just copy and paste the code from your friends. You know, the way I kind of imagine this, the way the kind of the best way to go about this is you know, if you're running to an issue with the code, you're not really sure what's going on, you know, sit down with your friend, show them your code, and then you know, your friend can if they've kind of gotten past this part. They can kind of you know walk you talk you through it and kind of say you know maybe you should change this line here maybe you should try this um, and so it's a much more interactive thing and so you know it's not just you know someone sends their code to you over Discord and you just copy and paste it for you know, um, for the report and so you know, no copy and pasting but you can work together okay um, it's a fine line it's it's kind of a fine line I know but you know but you know I, I do want you guys to think that you know I do want I do want you guys to feel like your classmates are available to you to help. But you know, but there's a limit to it, and you know, I think you guys kind of know what, what the limit to that is. Okay, so final remarks, and so this project, um, you know, it's going to be a lot of work, you know, both from the coding perspective and writing the report. Um, but you know, but you know, just like your classmates too, I'm going to be available to you throughout this entire process. So you know, please don't hesitate to reach out um, if you're having trouble, whether it be with the coding aspect or maybe you know you need help writing the report. You know, I'm I'm going to be available, and so you know, I'm here during office hours. I'm here during the lectures, after the lectures, before the lectures. Um, if those times don't work out for you, then you know, just you know shoot me an email. We can set up a time. You know, make use of me. And so you know, I expect to be very, very busy over the next few weeks. You know, mostly helping you know you guys as well as the other classes I have, helping you, helping you know with your final product. Okay. And so when I say I'm really busy, that means I'm I'm reserving time for you guys to ask me questions about the project. Okay. So don't don't be afraid. You know, don't feel like you know you're bothering me or anything like that. Um, you know, use me as a resource because, you know, I want everyone, you know, because this project is cool. I think this is, uh, you know, one of the cooler projects that I've, I've you know, that, that I've, I've, I've written for this class. And the result actually look, visually looks really cool. And so I want everyone to kind of feel, you know, a sense of accomplishment from this uh, from this project. I want you guys to have something that you can show off maybe in your, in your resumes, your portfolios. Um, and so I want everyone to kind of reach that point. So, you know, please make use of me, you know, please ask for help. You know, I'm, I'm always available. Even even for something, you know, there's no question that's too silly, you know, especially with, with MATLAB coding. And so, you know, you can even come to me and say, you know, honestly, I just have no idea how to start. And that's that's a legitimate question. And that is something I'm, I'm more than happy to help you out. Okay? Because starting a project like this, it's 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 intimidating. So, you know, you want I want to make sure you want you want to make sure you're, you're going off on the right foot. And I'm here to kind of help you get get to that. Get to that. Okay. Okay. Um, any final questions on, on the project here? Okay. All right. So all that, uh, all that information is there for you. So definitely, you know, uh, definitely read it on your own. So, you know, I, I know I went through it here, but there is more detail in, in the specifications. So, you know, make sure you read all that before you get started. Uh, and then you can use these starter codes here. I guess the videos are just never going to work on campus. So, okay. Okay. So let's come back to, um, the notes for today. Okay, and so um, for today, you know, we're going to be continuing on with our um, discussion of finite volumes. Right? In particular, we're we're learning about um, you know how to do diffusion with finite volumes. Okay. So let's pick up where we left off. We're talking about two D fusion. Finite. Okay. And so remember, diffusion is something that we're familiar with. And so we did diffusion with finite differences before, um, except now we're doing it with a different method, which is finite volumes. Okay. And remember, the, the idea with finite volumes is that you know, we take our differential equation, we take our governing equation, and we integrate that equation across a, our finite volume cell. So I'm not going to write out the whole equation again, just because that's, uh, you know, this is just kind of just review. But let me draw the cell again. 
So this is a typical finite volume cell in 2D. And what we're doing is we're integrating our governing equations over the cell. Okay, so remember in 2D, that means we're doing a double integral, right? So we're taking our you know, typical diffusion equation, which is our second order derivative of source, and we're performing a double integral. Okay. And from there, remember what we did with finite volume is that we performed a lot of integration tricks, right? And so we, we basically taking our integral and simplifying it in a way that makes it easier to work. And so I'll skip, I'll skip all the derivation just because, you know, we did that last time. But eventually, you know, we ended up with an expression that looks like this. Okay? We have minus K line integral around the boundary of the cell times the gradient of phi dot product with M hat gas. Okay. And remember what this, what this means here is we're performing a line integral around the outside of the cell. And so we're basically going to be tracing out the, the boundaries of the cell. So we're basically like this. We're integrating around that boundary. So we're basically walking, you know, you can imagine the, the cell is kind of like a track and you're just walking around the outside of this. Okay. Okay. And remember what we did, uh, just because our cell here has sharp corners, and we broke up our line integral into four different integrals. So one for each side of the cell, right? And so the way we broke this up is that I have an east side, a north side, west side, and a south side. Okay. And then what we ended up with was something like this. And so of course, you know, I'm, I'm skipping steps in the derivation just because we, we did it last time, but we ended up with uh, the following result. And so our line integral is split into four different terms. And so we have a minus K times partial phi, partial X on the east face, multiplied by delta y plus partial b partial y on the north face times delta x minus b partial x on the west face delta y minus partial p partial y on the south face delta x, okay? So the key here, or what we uh, what we want to uh, what we want to compute are all these derivative quantities here. Okay. And what's special about these derivative quantities is that these are derivatives, or these are quantities that are evaluated at the faces of the cells. Okay. And so if I go back up to the to the drawing that I have right there, right? And so when I say that we're evaluating partial P partial X on the east face, we're basically evaluating it right here where I'm putting this big pink dot, right? So here we want partial P partial X on the east face, okay? And then we'll put a big pink dot right here. So this would be partial P partial Y on the north face, big pink dot partial phi, partial x, west face, big pink dot, partial 
special fee. So, okay. so that's essentially what we that we that we want to do. Okay. And what's unique about those cell phases, right? And the reason that we kind of bring them up is that normally those cell phases are kind of at their, they're kind of at the interface between one cell and the next. So usually the way that we compute these in the, in the event that we have neighbors on all sides is we make use of the neighboring cells. We make use of this cell in particular and just whatever neighboring cell is on that side, okay? We use neighboring cells to compute these. <clears throat> all right, so all that is fine and good. So all that works out great if we if we do have neighboring cells. Um, but you know, as you know, you know, as as you know, um, as you've seen throughout this class, we're not going to have neighboring cells all the time. And so we might have a situation where our cell is on the boundary, and we have to apply a boundary condition instead. Okay. And so last time on Wednesday, you know, what we did was we, we went over the case of a Dirichlet boundary condition. Um, and so what I'm going to start with today is what we're going to do for the case of a Neumann boundary condition. Okay. okay. But I wanted to kind of review just because, you know, this, this process of finding volumes, I know can be a little bit disorienting. It's a lot of integrals. Um, it's a lot of integral tricks. There's, there's kind of a lot going on. So, you know, I wanted to make sure I kind of review this uh, just so everyone kind of uh, remembers kind of why we're doing things and kind of how we got here. Right? Um, okay, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right, so let's go over Neumann. BC. Planet volumes. And so the first thing, you know, the first thing we, we kind of need to establish here, a first, a first warning that I want to say is that you want to be careful when applying these Neumann boundary conditions, because the signs can change very easily depending on which side um, of the cell is that we're, that we're, that we're covering. Okay. Okay, so I want you to be careful doing these. And so, um, you know, really think about kind of what, uh, or kind of really observe kind of what side of the cell we're applying the boundary condition on, because that's going to determine, you know, what, what sign is it's going to take. Okay, so I'll do a couple examples. So I'll show you one example where the, the, the sign ends up being one way, and another example where the sign ends up being the other way, just so that you can, you can kind of see. Okay, okay. So let's do a, kind of a quick kind of theoretical example. So let's look at a let's look at a situation where we, ha where we have a Neumann boundary condition on the south um, south face of the cell. Okay. We have a situation like this, and so we have our cell here. And then on the bottom of the cell, we have partial phi, partial n, equal to gamma, okay? So this right here is gonna be our phi sub c, so that's gonna be our central cell. And we'll go ahead and assume that we have neighbors on each side. So we have uh, on all the other sides, we have a neighbor to the east, we have a neighbor to the north, a neighbor to the west. And so to start, you know, I'm going to start from the, 
from the from the place where we had up here. Okay, so we have all of our face our face uh, derivative terms, and so that expression is a minus k. We have partial phi, partial x on the east face delta y plus partial phi i north face delta x minus partial phi partial x on the west face delta y minus partial phi partial y on the south face of delta x. Okay. So I'm starting, I'm, the reason I'm starting here is that, you know, this is, this is kind of a conceptually kind of the best place to start, um, just so you can kind of see what's, what's going on. Okay. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, all of the face terms that we have neighbors on, and we're going to plug in the standard, kind of the standard form, right? And so we have a neighbor on the east, we have a neighbor on the north, we have a neighbor on the west, okay? And so for these ones, so for north, east, and west, we use standard form. And so because we have neighbors on the north, east, and west, uh, you know, we can just use our kind of standard form, okay? And so for the east, our standard form for that is phi east minus phi sub c, all divided by delta x, okay? On the north, we have phi sub n, phi sub c, divided by delta y. And on the west, we have phi sub c minus phi sub w, all divided by delta x, okay? All right, and so now let's look at the south, uh, the south face term, okay? And so on the south face, we have to compute partial phi partial y um, evaluated at that south face, okay? Let's look at the Neumann boundary condition that's on the south face. And so on the south face, we have partial phi partial n is equal to gamma, okay? And so what that tells us is that the derivative of the solution on that side of the cell is equal to gamma, okay? So we're in luck. And so what we have here in our expression here is exactly that derivative. And so we have partial phi partial y. Okay? Um, it's not quite partial n, but you know, on the south face, the normal direction is the y direction. And so we can, we can use that. And so what we can do is we can take this Neumann boundary condition and plug it directly in here. Right? So what we're going to plug in for that is just simply just gamma, just in for that. All right, so let's go ahead and... Uh, um, Let's go ahead and uh, finish this out, okay? And so if we simplify all these things, we have a minus k, we have, we have a b sub e minus b sub c divided by delta x times delta y plus b sub n minus b sub c divided by delta y times delta x. And then finally, what we have at the end there is just a minus gamma delta x. Okay. So all I did there was I just plugged in, I plugged in all the standard forms, I plugged in the Neumann boundary condition. Okay. All right, and all this is equal to, um, you know, I, I kind of forgot for neglected to kind of mention at this point, but remember we have the source term on the right-hand side. So we have Q, xc, yc, delta squared. Okay, so we can't forget that. Okay.
Okay, and so from here, all we're gonna do is just, we're gonna simplify. So we're gonna keep all the fee terms on one side of the equation and we remove everything else to the other side. And so in this particular case, you know, we only have one non-fee term on the left, which is the gamma term. And so we're gonna move the gamma term to right hand side. Okay. Also, what we're gonna assume just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna assume the grid spacing is the same in the X and Y direction. So we're gonna assume Delta X is equal to Delta Y. And I'm just gonna use shorthand, just Delta for that. Okay. We're assuming even grid space. Because that, what that allows us to do is that we can cancel out all these delta x times delta y, delta x over delta y, delta y over delta x. Okay. And then we end up with the following. And so what we get, I'm going to keep the minus k over here, but you know you can you can move it to the other side of the equation if you want. And so we have a minus k times p sub e plus p sub n plus P sub W minus three P sub C. Okay. And this is equal to Q of XC, YC, delta squared. And we have a minus K gamma delta. All right, so that's a situation for when the Neumann boundary condition is on the south. Okay. And so, you know, what you'll notice on the left hand side here, just, just to kind of check your work, you should see that all the neighboring cells are involved. And so we have the east, the north, and the west. Uh, but the south one obviously is not there because, you know, we don't have a south neighbor. Okay. And then our Neumann boundary condition is moved to the right. Another thing you should notice is the coefficient in front of phi sub c. And so normally, you know, if, we, if this were an interior cell and we had neighbors on all sides, you know, that would be a minus four phi sub c. But since this is the Neumann boundary condition, we keep it at a minus three uh, phi sub c. Okay. Any questions on, on how we obtain this result here? Okay, so let's, let's do another example with the Neumann boundary condition. But I want you to kind of pay attention to, to this sign right here. Okay. And so if you'll notice, you know, when the Neumann boundary condition is on the south, we end up with a minus k gamma delta on the other side. Okay. Let's see what happens when we have a uh, Neumann condition on another side. So let's use the east side. So just like before, I'm going to draw our configuration here. We have phi sub C. This is phi sub N. S. Sub W. And we have partial phi, partial N is equal to gamma on the right hand side. All right, just like before, let's start with our, our kind of a generic form, which has all the phase terms. So we have minus K, partial phi, partial X on the east face, delta Y, plus phi partial Y on the north face, delta X minus uh, partial phi, partial X on the west face, Delta Y minus partial phi, partial Y, delta Y on the south. Okay. Question. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug in for our face, our our our, our face terms now. Okay. Let me circle all the standard ones. Okay. And so since we have a neighbor on the north, we have a neighbor on the west. 
We have a neighbor on the south. We can use standard form for these. But for this one, we're just going to plug in gamma for that one, okay? because, it, because it's the Neumann boundary condition. Okay. So let's see how that affects our results. And so we plug um, everything in for that. So we have a minus K times gamma y plus sub N minus phi sub S, phi sub C, excuse me, all the way by delta Y, delta X minus sub C minus V sub W all over delta X, delta Y minus V sub C minus V sub S X delta Y delta X. So this should be an X up here. And all this is equal to Q of XC, YC, delta squared. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify this. And so just like before, we're gonna assume our grid spacing is the same. So delta X, delta Y, all these are just gonna cancel out, okay? We're going to keep all the phi terms on the left. And so on the left, we have a minus k times phi sub n times phi sub s, or plus phi sub s, plus phi sub w, minus 3, phi sub c. Okay. And then all the non phi terms, which is just the gamma, we're going to move to the right. So we have q, x, c, y, c, delta squared, plus k, gamma. Okay, so what do you so what do you notice about this uh, this expression here, right? Compared to our last one, we have a positive k um, gamma uh, gamma delta, right? If you compare that to our previous result, we had a negative k gamma delta, right? And so this is what you have to be careful of for the Neumann boundary condition is that depending on which side of the cell that you're on, you know, you're going to get a different sign on the right hand side. Okay. Okay, but I'll go ahead and kind of and, and kind of give you a hint. So there's basically two cases. Okay. So the sign So the first case is, is if you're on either the north or the east base. If you're on either the north or the east base, you're going to end up with a, well, you're going to end up with one case. I don't want to say positive or negative because it also depends on the sign of the Neumann boundary condition itself. Okay. You know, but for the sake of, but, you know, just for the sake of kind of uh, uh, being clear with this, let's just say you end up with a positive Neumann boundary condition. Um, on the right-hand side. So that, that was our second example. So the second example, we had our Neumann boundary condition on the east face. So that's why we had a positive Neumann condition on the right. Okay. The other condition is if you're on, uh, if your Neumann condition is on the south or the west face, And so in this case, you end up with a negative Neumann right-hand side. Okay. You want to be careful about doing these. Um, and this applies for both um, you know, your hand calculations and the code as well. Okay. So you want to be careful. Um, you want to be careful. Okay. <clears throat> All 
All right, any questions on any questions on this? Okay, all right, so let's do an example to kind of put it all together just so you can see the hand calculations. Um, you know, go from start to finish, and then we'll go over the code for this one as, as well. Okay, so let's say we have a 2D domain. We're going to break this up into finite volumes. And so in this particular case, I'm going to do 16 cells. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. Okay. On the left hand side, we have fee is equal to 50. On the south side, we have fee is equal to 25. On the right hand side, we have uh, partial fee, partial n is equal to zero. And on the top, we have partial fee, partial n is equal to 10. And our equation for this problem is going to be partial squared fee, partial x squared plus partial squared fee, partial y squared is equal to 3xy. Okay. So from this, we see that our k value is minus 2. Okay, and so for this problem, what we want to do, I'm not going to do all of them because it's going to take a lot of time, but in this problem, what, we're, what we want to do is we want to write out the finite volume equations for all 16 cells in our group. Any questions on uh, any questions on just the setup of the problem? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and, and get rolling. So I'm going to do three examples here. So I'm going to do an interior cell. I'm going to do a, a boundary cell, and I'm going to do a corner cell. So a corner cell is going to be be interesting. So let's do an interior cell first. Let's just choose one at random. Let's do cell six. And so the reason we call cell six an interior cell is that it has neighbors on all sides, right? And so we can apply kind of our general interior cell equation. So our interior cell equation is minus K, P sub N plus P sub E plus P sub W, plus P sub S minus four P sub C is equal to Q X C Y C delta squared. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so because cell six is neighbors on all sides, we can just kind of plug right into this. Okay. And so since our K value here is minus one, we have minus minus one. So that's just positive one. And so on, on the left-hand side, we have the North neighbor, which is E10, plus the east neighbor, which is E7, plus the west neighbor, which is E5, and the south neighbor, which is E2, minus four, E6 is equal to three, um, X6, Y6, delta squared, okay? I wanna make sure I, I go over the code today, so you know I'm not, I'm not gonna be computing the X and Y coordinates of the cell, but just imagine that they're, that they're there. Okay, and so of course you can apply this to all the other interior cells. We have four of them in this problem. So we have cell six, cell seven, cell 10, and cell 11. Okay, so those are the only cells that we have neighbors on all four sides of them. Okay, okay. let's do a boundary cell. Let's 
let's go ahead and pick one at random. Let's do cell number three. So cell three, <clears throat> we have a Dirichlet boundary condition on its south face. So what we're going to do, so I'm going to show you kind of the um, kind of starting from kind of the general equation, um, which is kind of good practice to do when you're first doing this. But, you know, um, once you kind of get good at this, then you kind of you can kind of see the patterns. Okay. okay. And so our general equation, we have minus K. Partial P partial X on the east face delta Y plus partial phi partial Y on the north face delta X minus partial phi partial X on the west face delta Y minus is it equal to Q of XC, YC, delta squared. Okay. <clears throat> and so for three out of four of these face expressions, we can use the standard form because we, we have neighbors on those sides. Right? So for all these ones, we can use standard form. South, uh, the south face term, you know, we're going to use our Dirichlet expression for this. Okay? And so instead of standard form, we're going to make use of the Dirichlet boundary condition, which is 25 in this case. And so with that, we have phi sub c minus 25. Okay. Yeah, that's the Dirichlet boundary condition on that, on that base. And we're going to divide this by delta y divided by 2. Okay. Because you remember from last Wednesday, whenever we apply the Dirichlet boundary condition, we're, we're only traveling half the distance, right? And so from instead of from one self-center to the next, we're traveling from the self-center to just the, the, the base of the cell. Okay. So that's why we divide by delta y divided by 2. Okay. So let's say that, you know, we, we go ahead and plug all this in. And we simplify it. So from that, we end up with the following. Okay, so, so I would definitely, you know, go ahead and plug everything in just to verify yourself, but, you know, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the result because I do want to spend at least 10 minutes on the code. Okay. So this is for cell three. So for cell three, we have the north neighbor, which is phi seven. We have the west neighbor, which is phi two. And the east neighbor, which is phi four. Okay. Once we apply the uh, um, once we apply the uh, the Dirichlet term, we end up with an extra phi sub c. So this is going to be a minus five phi sub c. Okay, and all this is equal to three x three y three. So that's the coordinates of the cell center for cell three. Okay, plus two times minus one times the Dirichlet value, which is 20. Right. So that's so that's for when you have one Dirichlet boundary condition on the uh, so. All right, any questions on, on this? Uh, it's not given. This is just a this is a theoretical problem. Yeah. 
but we assume that uh, the grid spacing is the same in both directions. That allows to um, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't we don't have a grid spacing because it's a Dirichlet boundary condition. So this grid spacing here, this delta y, is going to cancel out with this grid spacing delta x. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the two does the do the two does affect. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions on on this one here? Okay. So let's do one more example before we jump in the code. Let's look at a corner cell. Okay. So these ones are interesting because corner cells actually border more than one boundary condition. Okay. So let's pick a, um, I guess we'll keep it in the same neighborhood. So let's do cell four. Okay. And so cell four here has two boundary conditions. So we have a Dirichlet boundary condition on the south. And a Neumann. All right, so that means we're going to apply two uh, boundary conditions to our standard form. And so let's write out our, our standard form again. We have minus k, partial b, partial x on the east face, delta y. I know this is a pain in the butt to write, keep writing this down, but it's 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 good to kind of do for your, your first time students. I would argue that if you don't kind of start from here every time, that gets even more confusing. All right, so cell four is in the corner here. So cell four only has two neighbors. And so we only have a neighbor on the north and a neighbor on the west, right? And so there's only two expressions here that we can apply our standard form to. So that's going to be these two. For the other integrals, we're going to apply the boundary conditions. Okay. So let's start with the east in it, or the east face. And so if you go back to the uh, um, to the drawing of the domain, you can see on the east face for cell four, we have a Neumann boundary condition of zero, okay? And so in for this uh, green term that I've circled here, we're gonna plug in gamma is equal to zero here, okay? And then for this term, on the south side, we have our Dirichlet boundary condition. And in fact, it's the same as what we chose, as what we had on the last one, which is why I chose cell four, right? And so for this one, we're going to have P sub C minus 25 divided by delta Y divided by two. And so from the case when you have multiple boundary conditions, you know, as long as you kind of start from this kind of this, 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 uh, this form right here, um, you know, it, it, it becomes kind of just standard to kind of just apply it. Okay? And so I know it's, it's, it's going to be tedious to do this for the homework, but I definitely recommend you start from here just so that you can get your bearings and get used to doing finite volume because it is, it is quite a bit different than applying finite differences. Okay? okay. And so let's go ahead and plug everything in. And we end up with the following. And so cell four. Okay. And so we plug everything in. We get B3 plus B8 minus four B4 okay. is equal to three X4 Y4. And we have two boundary condition terms here. So we have one for the Dirichlet boundary condition, which is plus two times minus one. 25. And then we have one for the Neumann boundary condition. Since our Neumann boundary condition is on the east, um, we have a plus here. Okay. Plus k, which is minus one, times gamma, which is zero, and the unspecified grid spacing delta y. Okay.
Just go ahead and box it. Okay, so for a corner cell, you can see here that we have two boundary condition contributions to the right-hand side. Okay? So you wanna make sure that you capture that for all the corner cells, okay? So that's gonna apply to cell one, um, cell four in this case, cell, um, I think it's 13, and cell, um, cell 16, the top right cell. Okay. All right, any questions on, on how we did a corner cell here? Okay, all right, five minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll start looking at the code today and then I, and we'll finish up on Wednesday. So I, you know, I guess it's good that we extended the, uh, the homework deadline. Okay, all right, so this is a code I've posted for you online. And so if you go to the homepage and you go to week 12, um, this is gonna be the 2D diffusion FBM code. So that's there for you to see. And this code, just like before, is fully complete for you. Um, all you have to do is just kind of examine it. Okay. All right, so let's go over quickly right now, and we'll go over in more detail on, on, on Wednesday, right? So section one, this is all pretty similar, and so this is all pretty standard stuff. So you have the length of your domain, the number of cells in each, um, in each direction. Um, and for diffusion, the only thing we need is the diffusion coefficient, which is uh, minus one, okay? Okay, and then we come to the, uh, to the loop. Okay, and so since we have a 2D problem, we're gonna visit every cell in our grid. And so we have an, a loop over I, which is gonna be from one to NX, a loop over J, which goes from one to NY, okay? And we're going to specify the coefficients for each of the cells based on our location. Okay, so first, you know, uh, again, fairly standard stuff for 2D problems, we need to compute the ID numbers. Um, for all for the cell that we're looking at as well as its neighbors. And so we have my ID, West ID, East ID, North ID, South ID. Okay, so this uses our standard ID equation. And so even though we're using finite volumes, you know, we still use the same IV scheme because you know we number the cells in basically the same way that we number the, the groups. Okay. And so all that's going to be the same. And this is where we apply our um apply our integrals. Okay? And so remember, the, the main thing about the um, the main thing about finite volumes is evaluating each of those face terms, right? So we have a face term on the north, one on the east, one on the south, and one on the west. Right? And what and what coefficients you add are going to depend on whether you're on you know whether you have a neighbor on that side or whether you have a boundary condition on that side. Okay? And so that's what we're doing here with this if statement. And so you know I'm basically combining the the, um, the east and west terms together. Okay, into one giant if statement here. And then I'm doing the north and south ones together as well. Okay. And so if you can see from the note here, we're gonna check the X direction to see if we're bordering a boundary, either on the east or west. Okay. And so if we look at this first part of this if statement, so we say if I is equal to one. Okay. So in other words, our I coordinate is, is, is one, it's on the very left-hand side. That means we're on the west boundary. So that means we're gonna apply our traditional boundary condition of 50. And so in that particular case, you know, we add 3K um, to the diagonal term. We subtract a K from the east neighbor because we have an east neighbor. And then on the right-hand side, we add this 2K times 50, which is the, uh, um, which is the Dirichlet value, 50. Okay. And on the east integral, we check the same thing. So for the east, for the east side, we have a Neumann boundary condition. Okay. And so that changes our coefficients a little bit. And so instead of adding 3K, we add just a regular K. And then for the west one, we subtract a K, you know, because we have a west neighbor on the east face. And then we have our Neumann condition here. So our Neumann condition on the east is a zero. We multiply by K and we multiply by the grid space. Okay. In the case, and so, you know, the last case here is the ELF statement. So for the case that we're not either on a west, on the west boundary or the east boundary, we have an interior cell. So we have neighbors on each side. And so if we have neighbors on each side, we just add a 2K. Um, to the diagonal term, to the my ID comma my ID, we have a minus K for the uh, West neighbor and a minus K for the East neighbor, okay? And so this, this, this if statement here, it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing when you're looking at it first, but because, you know, we're looking at just purely the X direction, I combine the East and the West faces, and then that's what gives us, what gives us this, okay? Okay, any questions on, on this? 
Okay, and if you look here, the second if statement is basically just the mirror image for the north for the uh, for the y direction. And so I have, you know, if we're on the south boundary, the north boundary, okay, um, and the boundary conditions are of course adjusted because we have different boundary conditions in those ones, and we have the interior cell ones as well. Okay, and then from there we add the source term as well, and after that we just solve. Okay, on on Wednesday what we'll do is I'll, I'll bring up this code again, and I'll, I'll I'll kind of give a little bit more explanation in terms of you know why I chose three k here, two k here, and k, um, but you know it's a little bit too much to explain in kind of the last thirty seconds. Um, but you should be able to use this. And so if you want to get started on the coding problem, 3B on the homework five, um, this starter, this, this code here will kind of give you a good start. Okay. All right, any final questions before we wrap it up for today? Okay, all right, so that's all I got. So let's, uh, so let's pick this up again on Wednesday. Uh, so thank you guys for coming today as, as always. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So, so it's.